Carmilla. Chapter 9. The Doctor. As Carmilla would not hear of an attendant sleeping in her room, my father arranged that a servant should sleep outside her door, so that she could not attempt to make another such excursion without being arrested at her own door. That night passed quietly, and the next morning early, the doctor, whom my father had sent for without telling me a word about it, arrived to see me. Madame accompanied me to the library, and there the grave little doctor, with white hair and spectacles, whom I mentioned before, was waiting to receive me. I told him my story, and as I proceeded, he grew graver and graver. We were standing, he and I, in the recess of one of the windows facing one another. When my statement was over, he leaned with his, he leaned with his shoulders against the wall, and with his eyes fixed on me earnestly, with an interest in which was a dash of horror. After a minute's reflection, he asked Madame if he could see my father. He was sent for accordingly, and as he entered, smiling, he said, I dare say, Doctor, you are going to tell me that I am an old fool for having brought you here. I hope I am. But his smile faded into shadow as the doctor, with a very grave face, beckoned to him. He and the doctor talked for some time in the same recess where I just conferred with the physician. It seemed an earnest and argumentative conversation. The room is very large, and I and Madame stood together, burning with curiosity at the further end. Not a word could we hear, however, for they spoke in a very low tone, and the deep recess of the window quite concealed the doctor from view. And very nearly, my father, whose foot, arm, and shoulder could only could we see, and the voices were, I suppose, all the less audible for the sort of closet which the thick wall and window formed. After a time, my father's face looked into the room. It was pale, thoughtful, and, I fancied, agitated. Laura, dear, come here for a moment. Madame, we shan't trouble you, the doctor says at present. Accordingly, I approached, for the first time a little alarmed, for although I felt weak, I did not feel ill, and strength, one always th fancies, is a thing that may be picked up when we please. My father held out his hand to me as I drew near, but he was looking at the doctor, and he said, It certainly is very odd. I don't understand it quite. Laura, come here, dear. Now attend to Dr. Spielsberg, and recollect yourself. You mentioned a sensation like that of two needles piercing the skin somewhere about your neck on the night when you experienced your first horrible dream. Is there still any soreness? None at all. Can you indicate with your finger about the point at which you think this occurred? Very little below my throat. Here, I answered. I wore a morning dress which covered the place I pointed to. Now you can satisfy yourself, said the doctor. You won't mind your papa's lowering your dress a very little. It is necessary to detect a symptom of the complaint under which you have been suffering. I acquiesced. It was only an inch or two below the edge of my collar. God bless me, so it is, exclaimed my father, growing pale. You see it now with your own eyes, said the doctor with gloomy triumph. What is it? I exclaimed, beginning to be frightened. Nothing, my dear young lady, but a small blue spot about the size of the tip of your little finger. And now, he continued, turning to Papa, the question is, what is best to be done? Is there any danger? I urged in great trepidation. I trust not, my dear, answered the doctor. I don't see why you should not recover. I don't see why you should not begin immediately to get better. That is the point at which the sense of strangulation begins? Yes, I answered. And, recollect as well as you can, the same point was a kind of center of that thrill which you described just now, like the current of a cold stream running against you. It may have been, I think it was. I, you see, 
he added, turning to my father. Shall I say a word to Madame? Certainly, said my father. He called Madame to him and said, I find my young friend here far from well. It won't be of any great consequence, I hope, but it will be necessary that some steps be taken, which I will explain by and by. But in the meantime, Madame, it will be so good as to not let Miss Laura be alone for one moment. That is the only direction I need give for the present. It is indispensable. We may rely upon your kindness, Madame, I know, added my father. Madame satisfied him eagerly. And you, dear Laura, I know you will observe the doctor's direction. I shall have to ask your opinion upon another patient, whose symptoms slightly resemble those of my daughter that have just been detailed to you, very much milder in degree, but I believe quite of the same sort. She is a young lady, our guest, but as you say, you will be passing this way again this evening. You can't do better than take your supper here, and then you can see her. She does not come down till the afternoon. I thank you, said the doctor. I shall be with you then, about seven this evening. And then they repeated their directions to me and to Madame. And with this parting charge, my father left us and walked out with the doctor. And I saw them pacing together up and down between the road and the moat on the grassy platform in front of the castle evidently absorbed in earnest conversation. The doctor did not return. I saw him mount his horse there, take his leave, and ride away eastward through the forest. Nearly at the same time I saw the man arrive from Dranfield with the letters, and dismount and hand the bag to my father. In the meantime, Madame and I were both busy, lost in conjecture as to the reasons of the singular and earnest direction which the doctor and my father had concurred in imposing. Madame, as she afterwards told me, was afraid the doctor apprehended a sudden seizure, and that without prompt assistance I might either lose my life in a fit, or at least be seriously hurt. This interpretation did not strike me, and I fancy, perhaps luckily for my nerves, that the arrangement was pres that the arrangement was prescribed simply to secure a companion, would prevent my taking too much exercise or eating unripe fruit or doing any of the fifty foolish things to which young people are supposed to be prone. After half an hour, my father came in. He had a letter in his hand and said, This letter has been delayed. It is from General Spielsdorf. He might have been here yesterday. He may not come till tomorrow, or he may be here today. He put the open letter into my hand, but he did not look pleased as he used when a guest, especially one so much loved as the general, was coming. On the contrary, he looked as if he wished him at the bottom of the Red Sea. There was plainly something on his mind, which he did not choose to divulge. Papa, darling, will you tell me this, said I, suddenly laying my hand on his arm and looking, I am sure, imploringly in his face. Perhaps, he said, smoothing my hair caressingly over my eyes. Does the doctor think me very ill? No, dear. He thinks if the right steps are taken, you will be quite well again, at least on the high road to a complete recovery in a day or two, he answered a little dryly. I wish our good friend the general had chosen any other time. That is, I wish you had been perfectly well to receive him. But do tell me, Papa, I insisted. What does he think is the matter with me? Nothing. You must not plague me with questions, he answered, with more irritation than I ever remembered him to have displayed before. And seeing that I looked wounded, I suppose, he kissed me and added, You shall know all about it in a day or two. That is, all that I know. In the meantime, you are not to trouble your head about it. He turned and left the room, but came back before I had done wondering and puzzling over the oddity of all this. It was merely to say that he was going to Karnstein, and had ordered the carriage to be ready at twelve, and that I and Madame should accompany him. He was going to see the priest who lived near those picturesque grounds upon business, and as Carmilla had never seen them, she could follow when she came down with Mademoiselle, 
we bring materials for what you call a picnic, which might be laid for us in the ruined castle. At twelve o'clock, accordingly, I was ready, and not long after, my father, Madame, and I set out upon our projected drive. Passing the drawbridge, we turned to the right and followed the road over the steep Gothic bridge westward to reach the deserted village and ruined castle of Karnstein. No sylvan drive can be fancied prettier. The ground breaks into gentle hills and hollows, all clothed with beautiful wood, totally destitute of the comparative formality which artificial planting and early culture and pruning impart. The irregularities of the ground often lead the road out of its course and cause it to wind beautifully round the sides of broken hollows and the steeper sides of the hills, among varieties of ground almost inexhaustible. Turning one of these points, we suddenly encountered our old friend, the general, riding toward us, attended by a mounted servant. His portmanteaus were following in a hired wagon, such as we term a cart. The general dismounted as we pulled up, and after the usual greetings, was easily persuaded to accept the vacant seat in the carriage, and sent his horse on with his servant, the and sent his horse on with his servant to the Schloss.